seas, with never-ending stories to be told, creating bonds of life and preserving it. Capco, in just about everything. Volunteer tourism is booming in Cambodia, with more and more foreigners helping out in the country's orphanages and schools. But with claims of mismanagement and corruption, are these projects doing more harm than good? 101 East, at this time, on Al Jazeera. This is Al Jazeera. Hello and welcome to the News Hour. I'm Tay Mornabili from Al Jazeera's news centers here in Doha and in Washington, D.C. These are the main stories. <laughs> Protesters play on while Egypt's new cabinet tries to resume business as usual. President Mubarak offers government workers financial incentives in a bid to win popular support. Also, signed and sealed, but South Sudan will have to wait at least five months until Africa's newest nation is delivered. I'm Shia Bratansi in Washington. The top story from the Americas, expanding a media empire. AOL is set to buy online newspaper The Huffington Post for more than $300 million. Plus, up in smoke, a fire destroys thousands of costumes made for Rio de Janeiro's carnival next month. Now, it's just gone 1 a.m. in Egypt, where protests aimed at ousting the president show no sign of ending. Hundreds of people have been killed after two weeks of unrest. But despite talks between the government and the opposition, thousands of people are still demonstrating. Let's take a look at where things stand right now. Hosni Mubarak has held his first full-fledged cabinet meeting on Monday since he sacked his old cabinet a little more than a week ago. No major decisions were taken on reform, but the cabinet has decided to give government employees a 15% salary increase. Well, meanwhile, the protests are continuing. These were the scenes in Cairo's Liberation, or Tahrir Square, earlier on Monday night. Now, there have been calls for another mass march on Tuesday. But the numbers do now seem to be dwindling, and there are concerns among the pro-democracy protesters themselves that their movement may be running out of steam. Now, also on Monday, we saw a senior Google executive, Wael Ghanim, being released. This video was uploaded to the website YouTube. It seems to show Ghanim being captured on January the 28th. Now, he has now spoken to an Egyptian channel just a short while ago. First of all, I send my condolences to all the people who were killed. It was a peaceful revolution. We didn't want to do any damage. Don't focus your cameras on me. I'm not a hero. The real heroes are the youth who are behind this revolution. By God's will, we're going to clean this country of this rubbish. Now, also on Monday, public tribute was paid to a journalist killed during last week's violence. Jackie Rowland reports. The death of a reporter. Ahmed Mahmoud was shot and killed as he took photographs of the police beating demonstrators near Tahrir Square. Inside the building, the president of the journalist syndicate comes to speak to the widow. Suddenly, he is mobbed by an angry crowd, hounded out as a crony of Hosni Mubarak. Numerous journalists have been beaten up and detained in the last two weeks. The one man so far to pay with his life worked for a state Egyptian newspaper. For Egyptian journalist Ahmed Mahmoud, he is a martyr of this revolution. They're not only mourning his death, they're also demanding that President Mubarak is The journalists' union say Ahmed Mahmoud was deliberately targeted by the security forces. They want his killer put on trial. We want justice for Ahmed Mahmoud. We want justice for all the people now in Al Tahrir Square and all Egypt. We want justice for this uh, youth who, uh, who bring this revolution and uh, someone want to steal it from them. The marchers are now close to Tahrir Square. They reach the first barricade. The anti government demonstrators are tense. They fear that Mubarak supporters may be trying to pass, but the procession is allowed through. 
On Wednesday, hundreds of young men were killed by the horses and the weapons. And I was there, I saw them. So, so it is not just one, one shaheed, hundreds of shahada. Ahmed Mahmoud, honored on this day, is only one among hundreds who have died. And in Tahrir Square, the vigil continues. It will end, the people say, only when Hosni Mubarak steps down. Jackie Rowland, Al Jazeera, Cairo. Well, Ahmed Mahmoud is not the only journalist who saw trouble over the past few weeks. The Egyptian authorities have been active in detaining both journalists and activists during these protests. And Daniel Williams, who's with Human Rights Watch, has been one of those who was detained. He spent 36 hours in military detention last week. He's now in Rome, and he joins me on the line from there. Thanks for being with us. It's somewhat ironic, really, isn't it, that uh, one of the major themes of these protests has been the anger over the lack of freedom of the media, uh, and yet the government has responded by getting even more violent. Tell us a little bit about your experiences. Well, I was up at the uh, Hisham Mubarak Law Center at uh, Souk al an open-air market in central Cairo. The Law Center is a pioneer human rights organization in Egypt. In any case, um, at one point, the door to, uh, to the building was blocked by a sort of a mob. And a little bit later, um, some uh, military policemen led up some uh, a policemen, some uh, plainclothes agents, and some sort of... Uh, uh, henchmen in plain clothes to uh, rifle the office, break some windows, yell at us, and eventually detain us and take us away. About 30 people. Uh, what sort of treatment were you given in your time in detention, and what treatment did you see being given out to the other journalists and, and activists that were arrested? Well, we were, um, as I say, we were kept for uh, about 36 hours. We were handcuffed downtown and kept on the floor for some time. Uh, a lot of our stuff was taken away and not returned, um, computers, passports, and even money. Uh, we were led from the building after midnight uh, through a mob, in fact, of people who were pounding on our bus and so on. And then we were kept at a place called Camp 75 out in Heliopolis, northeast uh, part of the city, for a long period of time. Uh, I don't think we got the worst treatment of... Uh, people who may be detained around that time. We heard uh, there are many other Egypt many Egyptians who were brought into the same place uh, mm -hmm. during the course of the time there. And we could hear howls of scream uh, of pain in the in the in the place. Um, and we don't know what was going on because we were blindfolded. In any case it was mostly the uncertainty. Uh, that was a problem for us, and we were, of course, not allowed to communicate with anyone outside. So not just your personal experience, but your work with Human Rights Watch, you're clearly familiar with scenarios like this. Do you have any faith that even if we do see meaningful political reform in Egypt, that there's going to be a strong move towards redressing some of this behavior? Because, after all, uh, this kind of behavior becomes entrenched, doesn't it? A culture of, of suspicion against activists and media is, is going to be hard to get rid of. Well, this is, of course, the question that this little incident with many of the other events of the past few days raises. What is Egypt transitioning to? Transition is the big word now. But um, if it's just the question of uh, President Hosni Mubarak uh, leaving somehow and the system remaining in place, which is, uh, you know, has included torture and arbitrary arrest and restrictions on speech and assembly and so on, that wouldn't be much of a transition. So this is, this is the question, and this, the, our incident raises the issue of where the army stands on those things. It was acting in concert with other security agents in the way um, of the past. We don't know what the way of the future is. All right. We'll leave it there. Thank you, indeed for talking to us. Thank you. Now, some 8 million residents of South Sudan have been told they'll soon be living in a new country. It's what they wanted, of course. The official results from January's referendum just confirmed that nearly 99% of those voters chose to split from the north. The celebrations have already begun. But as Harun Mutasa reports, there are also some concerns about the future. 
It was expected most Southerners would vote to separate from the North, but the overwhelming numbers of people who did so is amazing for people here in the South. It just shows how desperately and how urgently people here have wanted to split and they voted for secession. The main hope for the people is that perhaps if they govern themselves, they will be able to develop a region that they feel has been neglected for many, many decades by officials in the North. It's going to be a huge challenge, a huge task for officials. Time may be against them. People here have high expectations. They want schools, they want hospitals, they want basic services like running water. This takes money, this takes help from the international community. But